Uh, I thought it was going second, so I was kind of surprised. I was planning on going to the washroom during the break. <laughs> but nonetheless, I was planning on reading tonight, so I will. Um, I remember Justin said something about William Carlos Williams not wanting to impose his feelings on the objects of the world, which is something I love to do because, because I can, you know, and I'm not a physician, I guess. <clears throat> so this first one is called uh, Highway Pastoral. Bright buttery yolk of sun against the grain. Wind marshaled wheat heads size up the horizon and decide it isn't time. The clouds are ticklish, full of good cheek, and we've seen this sky before in an insurance brochure or churchyard somewhere. We can tell from the scarecrow's expression that he dreams of fleeing the county for office lotteries and full dental. Doors burned by old flames, the barn gapes insatiably. I'm sick of chaff and combines, it says. Bring me your limbs. How's the volume? It's good. Can you hear me, Paul? Pretty much. Okay, that's good. Uh, this one's called uh, The Day God Left the Paradise Lodge. God's gone. I saw her take off with her lotions and oriental teas. But the timber women have resumed their calisthenics without grief, mindful of transients and jacuzzi wait times. No one else appears to care that imperfection shades the lodge like God's departure cloud, skewing orders and neckties in the dining hall while the wake-up guy misdials in the lobby and the bellhop's pores open up again. I can't describe the former bliss so suddenly relieved of us except to say that in its void, our longing for harmony is asserted everywhere. The beautician's restless filing, the muffled thrum of marital sex audibly off sync through drywall. At management's insistence, I've stopped lamenting the hot tub's acidity and the towel's inch just out of reach. I've lowered into the water, bubbling with delusions of perfect temperatures. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this next one, I stole and changed the title of a Robert Haas poem. It was called, The Failure of Buffalo to Levitate. This one is called, The Failure of New York to Levitate. By the time I realized my socks were mismatched, I was already at Grand Central Station. Not a spare inch to kneel or bend over without throwing someone a handful of ass. Right, right, right. You'd think those directions would be easy to remember, but this city is fissured from tip to tail. Alleys bloom into pockets of trash and nomadic grocers, all looking for a pinch, or so I've read. To be honest, I'm just glad I found your office. And to have guessed that you'd bring your children, how patiently they sit. Is the sheepish one inanimate or just out of sorts? Speak. Speak, child. Why has no one spoken since I got here? Uh, I read this one at the ARC launch not too long ago, but I was kind of mush-mouthed that day, so I'm just going to read it again. It's not long. It's called Four Ways to Eat Your Dandelion. One, misanthropes, consider our public parks. More trees than a hawk's beard has feathers, jogging paths to discover spandex and revel in the names of dogs. Two, Protesters and false prophets may demonstrate for themselves within the free speech zone located between the waterfowl preserve and the experimental farm. Three, from the roots up under marble shrines for those late onset philanthropists whose descendants today fly coach for our secular libraries and museums. Four, and this one's for Ottawa. For representatives and councillors at the municipal level, catered affairs are encouraged both for the local economy and as a chance to compare spouses. This one's also for Ottawa, if you think about it. It's called, uh, These Flowers Are All Talking Heads. The dandelion said, I'm either frozen or assembled from lemon peels, baptized with salt crystals as another perennial species of the curb. And the lily said, I think it's funny that you think everyone should find happiness in all the same places as you, considering how unhappy you are. And the tulip said, both of you shut up before the wind comes back. My ovaries can't take another lashing. 
And the sunflower said, who are we to dictate what should or shouldn't happen? Today's dog urine wets us for the promised bellies of tomorrow's bees. This one is for the town I grew up in for the most part. It's the world's biggest planned city, last I checked. Um, I think the mayor is like 85 now, it's Mississauga. It's also for Etobicoke, which is like Mississauga Senior. It's called a uh, seven quarter grid line. What better way to celebrate new city limits than a transformer station? <laughs> We've seen this one before. The podium, the mayor spurting like a burst pipeline. Behind him, billboards plug peerless pediatrics and a dated exhibition on bees. Try to find the queen among all the workers and drones. Behind that, the ground, stapled with hydros, won't even shrug. A honey of an idea, speed up the city. There's room in bars and truth in numbers. The mayor even lets out a few. Three quarter centuries, faces in the millions, and the birth size almost doubled. We've seen this one before. A bloodshot octogenarian, our oldest citizen, tears the ribbon like a last catheter. Uh, this one's kind of a true story. We, we may or may not have had mice in my house, or in the roof of my house. Like, I live in a room that used to be an attic, and uh, they kind of just went away when it was warm enough to go outside. I don't really know what it was. But uh, this is the letter I didn't write to my rental agency. It's called, Regarding What the Contractor Found. Dear rental agency, the reason I did not contact you after hearing the fingernail patter of mice in the walls is that I did not wish to disturb the anatomy of the duplex. As housing experts, you must be aware that load-bearing beams are given to panic. While the elaborate rodents commit roots along the baseboards to memory, their mechanisms digest and redistribute the insulation. I think we can therefore agree that expelling their species from the home may disintegrate an otherwise complete circuit. Uh, I, was, I was going through kind of a hermit phase around December, uh, just because it was cold and lazy. But uh, I was kind of wondering like, what would it be like if I did just kind of live like that forever. <clears throat> so this poem is called Homebody. The wind coughed twigs and Methodist pamphlets onto his porch. He went back into his house, which had lately been trying especially hard to get his attention. He couldn't think about the faucets without them running. With breathy whirls from the ceiling fan and acutely exposed wiring, the house reminded him that soon it would be their anniversary and they would do something special, just the two of them. He was thinking he might throw on something loose and paint the underside of the stairs, or take that long tin drain pipe out from the garage and unclog the eaves. He would add to the tally on the basement wall and take a photo to have when he walked the plazas and rambling avenues where people spat on the ground like it wasn't there and the sky wrecked itself for attention. Uh, <clears throat> this next poem steals its last line from uh, a Dennis Lee poem, although he used it post-coital. Mine is more post-mortem. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's set in Tehran, Iran in 1995, and it starts from a with a quotation from Milton Acorn, which goes, uh, a silence so grim, no sparrow can flutter in. No sparrow. The prayer calls moaning from the minarets follow us home from the video store, stretching like clotheslines between the tenements. This is how and when we see the thing wiped on the asphalt half its wing and the inside's coral clockwork on the street. We are helplessly young and the bird still breathing. We lay it by a tulip stem on a bundle of your father's briefs. The videos are made to wait, the rice swollen and cold, your father's naked confusion secondary. The whole evening as it would have been suspends on the sparrow's trilled exhalations, each breath as twisted as the bird. We have seen the nostrils on its beak. We have not tucked the slack tissue back into its belly. It does not eat the flowers we pick. The next morning is a bird. 
My face in your eyes is two birds in the eyes of a bird. Our helpless youth is a bloodshot bird on a bed of tulips in the prayer called dawn. We watch the bird stir with dreams of fruit and found worms until movement rises from its breast and leaves its body full of listening. In actuality, the bird was most likely eaten by a cat because Iran is just teeming with cats. Nice Persian cats, but they're rabid and gross. Yeah. Um, this is the last one I'm going to read, but I just wanted to say thanks, Claudia, Jennifer, uh, Rod, and Rona, who aren't here, and all the exec. I'm really glad to be up here. I wrote this one about almost a year ago. Uh, it's called The Inevitablist, and it starts from a quote, with a quotation uh, from Don Mackay that goes, uh, where there is a doorbell, there must be a door. One. If a circle C is inside a triangle T, then it entails that C is smaller than T. The value of C would be unable to hold its end of the equal sign. If the equation were a gun draw at dawn, C would lose by a hair and buckle to its fate. Its lover and children would mourn by its torn arms and wonder why its body was built for bullets. If your hair is a lighthouse, then your chest is a sea change. If the earth rolls up on itself perpetually, then drifters are sometimes lost in its folds, and that door we saw by the curb is gone for good. If you believe everything I say, God help you. If you believe your mother, then I am hardly fit to drown. But if you are a shoreline, then I am a beach squid with so many hands. If the moon shows and tides me back, the decisions would outweigh me. I'd be abyssal. Two, I make my decision all over your pillow. My decision blossoms along the carpet. The sun's shapes on the walls are shadow spotted by my decision's traces on the window. To decide is to cut at the navel. My decision cowlicks your hair. To make love is to wrestle like thumbs. To pull out, to pull all the way out is to anticipate the peak of indecision and decide not to stay, but promise to come back with tissues. You say my decisions would be smaller if I didn't wait so long to make them. To accumulate is to build like clouds. I say it's a simple matter of washing up, but some of my decision has made its way to the doorknob. Three, if I decide to plant a door against the ground and open it, what would greet me? To entail is to extend from the hide. Decisions to do or die are made under shared conditions and may not be mutually exclusive. I unlace your bra, you do it up again. I try at your hem and you say I don't listen. You say words drown in my ears. Your ears are the ideal offspring of circles and triangles. Your nose is shaped like the void in my cheekbone, but your lips are ready for the sh shapes of names. And if my ears are as deep as you say, then words fall to the well of my head and I hear their echoes. By then, you've already packed. Thanks. <laughs>